years of Three Dog Night. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> if you well, had to on the healthy, if you had to pin it down to one thing, what would you say would be the key to the band's longevity? Uh, I think um, that we're uh, we're good live performers. We always were. You know, we were not. We were never uh, a lot of not a lot, but the, there are there are many groups that are that actually don't exist or fabricated in the studio or helped with, you know, a lot of technical assistance. And we were all, um, when the group happened, I was, uh, what, what, around 26, uh, 25, and I'd been in the business for a long time, and all of the guys in the band uh, and the other two singers um, were, uh, had worked for years. So we, we were, we uh, were, we are a very good live band, I think, and, um, also, uh, we had great songs that we sang, so I think that's those are the two main... C- and, of course, my wonderful looks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, do, do you have an early an earliest musical memory for, for yourself, a, a time where it really became apparent to you that, that music was going to be your career? Well, you know, I started late. Uh, in fact, I, the first time I really had my own guitar, I bought it... Um, I bought it... I was bicycling through uh, England and uh, I bought a bicycle I bought a I, I bought a um, uh, a guitar in Belfast I think in, uh, in Ireland on my way t- back to my hometown and uh, <laughs> so I started late and um, uh, I just got more and more into it but I actually got into it more of a uh, uh, I formed a couple of little trios, vocal trios, and I ended up uh, uh, getting into the studio end of it. So, so I, I don't think there was any one moment. You know, I think uh, if I was <laughs> to get a job at Hanna Barbera um, to, to, to audition, I had to go in and uh, write two songs within a half hour. And they gave me lyrics to "Hippity Hoppity Kangaroo" or something, you know. <laughs> and that once I, once I got into writing, and I got a job on the A and R department, that's when I I knew that's what I wanted to do. Cool. Um, is that true? I think I read somewhere that you you were one of the auditioners for the Monkees. Yeah, in a way, I was. Uh, <laughs> I knew uh, uh, Jack <clears throat> Nicholson lived above me, so I knew Jack. And Harry Dean Stanton, uh, they used to they used to come over and hang at my place. And they, uh, Jack was friends with Bob Rafelson. In fact, you know Jack wrote the uh, the Monkees movie. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. He was the writer. Uh, so uh, I had a friend named uh, Bruce, and Bruce went down for the for the audition, and um, I went down there with him. But I kind of just went down to to help him out. And I kind of, in a way, did an audition. Mm-hmm. But uh, I didn't technically march down there to do it. I had a mustache, and uh, I'd already, um, I was already a single act, you know. I thought I, thought I was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had a couple of top ten records in L.A. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, they turned me down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I now live uh, next door to, it's funny, to uh, Mickey Dolan's old house when he was in the monkeys oh right yeah alice cooper's house is the house i have there you go uh did you have a, a particular sound or a pre-plan or a blue, blueprint in mind for, for the sound of three dog night when when you got around to forming it yes um uh, absolutely i i was driving i remember the moment i thought of the group i was uh i was driving on wilshire boulevard past the old uh coconut grove and on the lawn, there was a Concourse d'Elegance. They had all of these beautiful cars, and they were all—they were all different, and they were all fabulous. And all of them on this field together just made this incredible look. And I—I just—I—I'd always liked trios singing. That's what I kind of put together before. And I thought if I could get a trio, guys that are lead singers. Uh, we all could take turns singing and lead that uh, that it would be a matter of just getting songs and we'd be off to the races <laughs> um, and then the band, we we uh, started working with Brian Wilson and, um, and it was more of a thing we didn't really have a band it was us in the studio with him 
and he, you know, he was stacking instru uh, instruments on the tracks. And uh, we, uh, <laughs> they basically, um, so some of the other guys in the group, one particular member, um, uh, we thought we were going to do an album, and the, the, we were kind of holding up the Beach Boys because we were taking Brian's time. So they wanted to offer us, a, you know, to just to release a single, and we didn't want to do that. So we didn't finish <laughs> the project, and then they went and, and uh, put their voice on uh, on Darlin, which uh, became a hit for them. That was for, for written for us. Um, for an old because I used to use that phrase all the time and then we went and got a band and uh, then we went through a couple of different band members <laughs> four musicians and uh, we were already formed as a group that, as a vocal group so then we got musicians to back us up we slowly be kind of, became kind of an important part of the, the sound the early days mm -hmm. and uh, that all just kind of uh, <laughs> happened uh, organically I guess you know. Was was there any one outfit or any one band that inspired for you that concept of multiple lead singers? Uh, well, we were trying to do something different. I mean, uh, you had, there were all the Motown bands were out, but they usually had, uh, when they performed, they'd have one guy out front and two or three guys doing steps in the background that were barely on the mic. And um, my other concept was I like the idea that we're basically really... Uh, uh, we tr the three vocalists w would treat uh, treat uh, the vocals um, as like a horn section, you know, where everybody was mixed at the same the same level. Mm -hmm. Whoever singing lead and whoever singing background on a lot of that harmony, they're 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 equal. They're all equal volume, so you get this big triad sound. Uh -huh. And that's what uh, many of the records have that. At assembling the the original lineup. How did we go about it? Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> I was neighbors with Jimmy Greenspoon, uh, who's the keyboard player. So he's still with us. And uh, <laughs> he was a friend from the old days. So uh, we, we, uh, we got a hold of him. We'd, uh, we'd also had been working with Van Dyke Parks. I don't know if you know who Van Dyke is. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so Van Dyke was... Uh, I just had dinner with him the other night. Uh, so he did some demos with us, too. Um, so we've got, we've got James <laughs> Greenspoon, and then um, we, uh, uh, the, the bass player had been in uh, Corey's band, in the blues band, so we, we got him, recruited him, and <laughs> he was friends when we were rehearsing. We rehearsed in an abandoned motel, and what we did is one of the guys who lived in the motel, the bass player, would... Uh, uh, you know the motel next door. We would we would plug into his wall and then run the electricity into the uh, abandoned uh, motel where we, we rehearsed. And a friend of his came down from Northern California, a guitar player. So uh, he was recruited into the band. And then we had a we auditioned a series of different drummers. And finally, one night at a talent at a talent show we did um, we we saw Floyd, the drummer, and. Uh, uh, he became the final member of of the band in the early days. You recall your first gig as Three Dog Night? The first gig as Three Dog. I remember the. Uh, I remember the first gig, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we we didn't have. I forget what the name was at the time. Um, the first gig we ever did was at a uh, was at a strip. It was at a bowling alley by the airport. Uh, that was a strip joint, <laughs> and we did five songs at about three in the afternoon. Uh, that's the first gig I remember. This one. The band had a real knack of, of finding songs by, by yet to be established songwriters. Correct. Who, who was it in the band that, that went about finding these songs? Oh, all of us. All of it? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the era <laughs> was a little different. Now, nowadays, uh, that's that's a it's a big problem. Um, uh, be, because if you have MTV and you uh, everything is so global, uh, in the old days you could uh, you could find a record that maybe was had been released in Germany or in England and uh, for one reason or another fell through the cracks and didn't wasn't known in this country, you know, or 
Uh, and w that was one way we we, uh, we used to find records or uh, uh, just <laughs> old records, backsides of records we all thought should have been hits that weren't hits. Mm -hmm. uh, dis dis distribution just was not so massive as it is now. And even though you were recording other people's songs, it was all, it always seemed to have your own trademark, the band's own trademark and style. I gather that was always important for you. Yeah, um, I think um, to the, to this day we the uh, we just uh, the critics really <laughs> give, give us no credit at all. I mean, we're written off as just some little novelty band or something. And uh, um, uh, <laughs> many of the songs we did had been released before by other artists and uh, it's because of our arrangement and our performance that I feel they was the reason they became hits brought out the but, best in the songs yeah I, yeah I don't think we ever really received any credit at all for that and it's and it's very it it, it bothers me a lot that um, uh, uh, how immense we were um, in the early 70s and it's uh, almost any book you read it's uh, with the kind of history has been rewritten about us you know I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, like you know Rolling Stone does a, <laughs> a retrospective of different uh, uh, you know they, they've got the different books they come out with and interviews and this and that and uh, we're, we're never mentioned it's as if we were never on the cover uh, you know, the cover of Rolling Stone, when we were on it, says, um, I got it, it's here. It says, more gold than the Stones, bigger crowds than Credence, uh, fatter purses than Elvis. Uh, you know, we were we were just really big. Yeah. And, um, anyway, that's my own little pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> And so you were receiving a lot of criticism at the time for, for not writing your own material. That was oh, a real absolutely. problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, uh, for some reason, Linda Ronstadt wasn't criticized, you know. Um, and uh, I don't know what, what, what the reason. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, it's, it is what it is, you know. My, my feeling is 30 years later, I'm, we do 100 dates a year, you know. So I'm thrilled. No. Was there any record company pressure on you to, to start providing your own material? Um, n no, uh, uh, they uh, they didn't care where the where the music came from. On the soul, yeah, yeah, and and uh, I mean we could have we could have because um, I was I wrote and I could have stuck six songs on a, on the album to get the publishing, you know, or or write backsides and stick them on uh, and stick them on whatever single. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't, uh, we didn't do that, you know. I was always, I was always for let's find, <laughs> let's record the ten best songs that are available when we go in to record. And um, it was never a thing of, well, let me just, let's just uh, get a lot of publishing. And we, we never asked for publishing from anybody, you know, of splitting, splitting the publishing. When we, even when we were really hot, uh, we were... We, we we were, I think, very pure when we went into the studio. Uh, everything was just about music. We, uh, as much as we all fought like brothers, um, it was good when we got in the studio. Yeah. Because uh, I think that destroys a lot of groups when they start writing and everybody starts saying, well, who's going to get the, who, you know, you wrote the last single and I, I should get the backside and public, you know, it gets... Yeah, the old clash of, of egos. You start making de decisions for the wrong reasons musically. Yeah. So what what particular qualities had to, had to be in a song to to make it one that you'd want to cover? Uh, for me, um, uh, I should have been more aware of lyrics, but uh, in general, uh, I'm a, a melody man. Uh, uh, a song just has to hit me with a hook, uh, and then sometimes it can be a lyric, but. Uh, uh, Generally, uh, there'll just be this ma a magic moment when I hear a song where it, uh, where the words, uh, the chorus, and the voice all will hit, uh, hit this little magic s spot, and um, you know that that to me is what uh, attracts me the most. Of all the major successes you you had during that period, was there was there any one moment, any one session that you'd done that the the moment you'd you'd finish, you knew you had something quite special before it was even released? Uh, well, you know, we weren't uh, we weren't re really. Um 
uh, that good. A lot of the songs that we picked as the first opening song usually was the one that we thought was the big single. Mm -hmm. And very rarely <laughs> was that the case. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard when you're in the studio. I would say when I heard the... Uh, um, the song I did called Black and White, when I heard the basic track, mm -hmm. uh, it really had something special. I thought that... Uh, Joy to the World, I didn't, that Bullfrog song, I didn't hear that at all. At all. No one did, actually. I think it was the third, <laughs> the third release from an album. You know, we'd released two other singles. Uh, um, I remember some magic moments. I remember um, when, in 69, I guess it was, late 69, we were, we were in, Lo in London. We played the Marquee. Oh, yeah. Uh, pardon me? No, that's fine. Keep going. Uh, we played the Marquee Club. And uh, all, of the, all of the bands had played there, the Stones and everyone on their way up. And it was our first tour over there. We had the number one record in America, but we were unknown in England. And uh, the show was, when I got off stage that night, I, I said, I think tonight we're the best band one of the best bands in the world, you know, as far as being tight and fresh. And, and we had, we snuck in Reggie Dwight uh, as a roadie. Uh, I just met him, you know, Elton John. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was back there with us, and it was just a magic evening. What were the circumstances surrounding uh, you leaving the band the first time? Oh, just burnout. <laughs> just plain, plain fed up, burned out, you know, just uh, having too much fun, partying, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know. <laughs> the usual story. The usual that, uh, you know, I'd say 50% of, you know, everybody did. No, yeah. Nothing, no uh, no special reason. No. You ran your own management and booking agency there for a while. Who? Me? Yeah. Myself? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mean, you mean um, when I was doing Fear? Yeah. Yeah, all the punk stuff. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we stopped in, like, six, 76. I, I spent about a year getting healthy. And then uh, for a couple of years, I retired. You know, I'd, um, I'd done all right financially. And um, I didn't have to do anything. I bought Alice Cooper's house up in the hills. You know, I used to wake up every day and, uh, and say, well, gee, I don't have to do anything today. So I got into running, and I got to, into running um, about nine miles a day out by the beach. And I used to, um, uh, a lot of older retired people lived out there in their 70s and 80s. And I used to run by and look at, see these old people staring out at the ocean. And I, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people now. <laughs> there's I've nothing, there's no, I don't have to work. Uh, I didn't want to hang hang with a lot of people I used to hang with, you know, the, it was very unhealthy. And um, I slowly got drawn back into going out to clubs, and the, the whole uh, new wave uh, punk scene was happening. Uh, and um, I ended up uh, seeing a band called Fear that I, I got very excited about, and that's how I got into management. Right. You, do you think that period uh, in management helped you in later years as a as an artist again uh, dealing with with management companies yourself? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I I saw. Um, I, I really. We don't have a manager now. I, I basically do all of the with ICM the agency. They phone me, and so uh, yeah, it helped me a lot yeah. as far as n knowing what to do. The kind of you know, having some kind of career direction. Sure. What else were you up to in that time leading up to, to getting the band back together again? Um, well, let's see. I went to, um, you mean from 77 to... Yeah. To a, I, I went to um, my, <laughs> my cousin who was a ex... He was a stockbroker. Uh, he, he one day left work. He weighed, I don't know, 260, 70 pounds. <laughs> and uh, he... He got on a bicycle and bicycled to Guatemala from uh, from Los Angeles, and he came back and he was about 187 pounds, very healthy, and he was raved about at the lake down there, there Lake Atitlan. So um, 
I'd been, you know, I had my own limousine and a uh, driver and all of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> my the end of my rock and roll days, and I just. Uh, which I I would stay up until six in the morning, and my curtains would be all blacked out, so there's no light in. So I just changed my life around, and as I said, I got into running and stuff like that. And what I did is, I went with him. <laughs> we uh, we uh, uh, how did I forget it? We got down to uh, we took the train down to San Diego, and then we took a cab to Tijuana over the border, and then we took a plane uh, to the to Mexico City, walked around there, and then went down to uh, <laughs> by bus all the way down to the to the uh, the border where Guatemala was, and then to got got off, stopped a little country bus, and uh, got on with a bunch of pigs and <laughs> chickens, and uh, ended up in this little lake, <laughs> Lake Atizlan. Um, it's you know Albus Huxley uh, had been there, and uh, it's one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. And uh, I stayed down there for a while, and uh, uh, then I came back. And that's kind of when I got into management. Would it be fair to say that perhaps uh, if you had not had that break, um, the, perhaps you wouldn't be celebrating the 30th anniversary of the band this year? You may not have uh, stuck it out. <laughs> probably. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I, you, uh, we, had, we, we had so many, we had so many hits. That uh, uh, in a, in such a short period of time, we had 21 top 40 hits in a row. So, and we were doing heavy touring. So you can imagine what it had been like. Mm. We would uh, we would we would, the day we would get home, uh, we'd have that day off, and the next day we were either doing interviews or we were uh, going down to the studio to listen to new material, or we were meeting with our business manager or meetings with the agencies, uh, just constantly, or rehearsing new songs for the next tour, or seeing set designers about the, uh, about our stage. So after five years of that, uh, with, you know, and partying, um, you're right, uh, um, I'd lost, all the joy had left. Yeah. You know? It was a break you had to have. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Tentativeness about about getting back together. Any worries about not being able to to rekindle the spark? <coughs> no, because we what we did is we went uh, we went to a rehearsal studio and got the uh, got everybody back together, and it just every everybody was enthused. It was great. It was um, we definitely wanted to do it. That was no problem at all. You have an incredibly uh, loyal and strong fan base. This this must make it a lot easier too to to keep going after all these years. It does, yeah. And they come to a lot of our a lot of our shows. You know, and they they've got a newsletter and and all of that stuff. And they're yeah, they are they are incredibly loyal. And our our <laughs> our attendance in our shows in the last seven years, if you saw a graph, or is just goes straight up. Yeah, it's getting bigger and bigger every year. So what's happening is. Uh, I think, luckily, a lot of the songs uh, are are good. They're nice, strong songs, and they weren't political. You know, they weren't trendy kind of songs or in any one style. So the songs last, and uh, I think there's always a new generation. And, of course, there's the nostalgia people and, and all of that. And um, uh, I sing higher now than I sang when I was 26. Really? I, my range is higher, yeah. Uh, well, I stopped smoking, so uh, <laughs> years, uh, you know, uh, twenty years ago. But uh, so I'm, I'm, and I'm healthy, so I'm very thankful. So it is a good mix of old and new fans coming to see you. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. complete mix. It is a complete, and and the, and the venues are are very varied too. We played uh, last year. We played to uh, <laughs> about sixty thousand people at Mile High Stadium. We were the headline act. And it was great. I mean, uh, we had, uh, Chuck Berry was on the show, The Four Tops, uh, 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 just a whole bunch of acts. And we, we, we headlined. It was amazing, you know. Uh, I was very honored. Could you run through the current lineup for us? Background of some of the guys there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Corey Wells, uh, the other singer. Uh, Jimmy Greenspoon, the original keyboard player. And Michael Alsop the original guitar player. Um, 
Pat Bouts on drums. He's been with us for maybe six, seven years. Longer, about the same amount of time as, the, as when the band originally formed. Um, and the bass, the bass player, uh, he also sings tenor harmony. He was with us for about five years in the 80s and left and he came back. And he's been back for about three years. Paul, uh, Paul Kingry. Mm-hmm. Who is actually an amazing uh, guitar player? But we already had a guitar player, so uh, he he shifted uh, to bass. Now and all all of the guys, all of the guys actually could be uh, the leaders of their own bands and be the lead singer. All the musicians, you know, they're all good singers too. Versatile. And they don't usually sing. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, like I said, they're just a bunch of. We're a bunch of old pros <laughs> that have been around for years. And you mentioned about 100 dates a year, and that, that's a comfortable level for you now? Yeah. My kids are, well, they're getting older now, and they have their own bands. Uh, the, the 15 and 13-year-old have a band, and uh, the 20, well, he's almost 22, he has his own band, the LC Slims. And uh, the little boys are... Um, are uh, well, I guess they're changed. The name used to be the Optics, but I think it's now Twelve Foot Stanley, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what we. My wife and I, what my wife Lori um, and I used to uh, have an uh, have an RV when they were real little, and we would basically book the, the summer. We had a, they had a big tour bus, and we routed it. So uh, we could make the date. So my wife and I and the little kids would uh, travel separately from the band. And uh, I would just show up at the gig, and then right after the show, jump in the RV. She'd have the engine running, and we'd take off for a, for a campground somewhere. So um, I've only been married once. I got married when I was 39. So I wanted to have uh, the kids, you know, and I yeah. did so many... Uh, Showbiz marriages where the where the parents never really got to be with their kids, mm. so the the it's comfortable. Your original question that I'm getting to is the hundred dates a year. Now we're doing fly fly dates, and the kids don't want me around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uncool. At 15, there couldn't be anyone more uncool than your father or mother. <laughs> you, know? you uh you had the pleasure of playing the Super Bowl earlier in the year. Yes. Well, actually, it's funny. We played it twice. We played it in 1992. Oh, did you? During the Desert Storm. But uh, they 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 only televised parts of it because they said uh, <laughs> they didn't want. Uh, it was not a joyous occasion and all of that stuff because of the war. So, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. What did you say? Yeah, we did play it uh, this year. I I think it was um, it was on television in Australia. We got a very brief glimpse of you, but no sound. Ah, yeah. Okay. Well, well, maybe next time. Yeah. How did it yeah. go anyway? Always wonderful. Yeah. It's a, it's a, always a thrilling, thrilling event, uh, and they, and the seats they give you are, we we're all, we we're all tempted. We didn't do it, but they were scalping our seats for five thousand two hundred dollars <laughs> a piece, and um, I thought, well, no, I better not do that. Mm. But uh, we have wonderful seats, and they, they really treat you well. I believe uh, you've been doing some recording for a new album? Yes. We've, uh, we just, we, well, what we did is we went in to, uh, to uh, just <laughs> get used to being in there again. We went in with our original producer, and what we did is we did some of our old stuff <coughs> just to get the sound on it. And we might, uh, uh, we might <laughs> use that to... Um, at some of our shows for people who want to want a live uh, live cassette of our stuff mm -hmm. but we uh, our main our, our main thing is to uh, do original stuff and we'll be <laughs> excuse me we'll be at Reno we'll be at Reno, <laughs> Reno for four days in about a week and a half and we're going to start rehearsing the new songs fantastic yeah Okay, Danny, look, I won't hold you up any longer. I want to thank you uh, very much for your time this morning and for uh, many, many years of musical enjoyment. And, You're welcome. And uh, what's on the books for the rest of 98 for you? Oh, we'll be everywhere. We're just, um, look up. Anybody who wants to know, just look up uh, on the internet, the 3dognight.com, 
and uh, that has our whole uh, tour schedule for the year. We'll be we we would. <coughs> They had. There was some talk about maybe maybe November or December trying to get some uh, something going with uh, going to Australia. Oh, yeah, terrific! Uh, yeah, my my wife is desperate desperately wants me to work there because she's she loves Australia. She's dying to go. Fantastic! I will. We'll be here waiting for you with bells right. on. We need the listeners to start uh, bombarding uh, <laughs> <laughs> the airwaves. We'll put the word around. That's great, Daniel. All the best. Thanks again. Thank you, John. And hopefully, we'll see you later in the year. Very good. Okay, take care.